Okay, welcome everybody to today's program live from London, the Labina, Labina, excuse me, Hibbid exhibition at the Tate Modern. My name is Karen Albert. I'm the director of the Hofstra University Museum of Art. And today uh, we're going to hear from Professor Lisa Merrill about her experiences working with the artist over, over the years and the exhibition that's currently on view at the Tate Modern in London. So Professor Merrill, is a, she's a professor of performance studies, rhetoric and public advocacy in the Department of Writing Studies and Rhetoric. She is a performance and cultural historian specializing in 19th century per performance and social issues on the stage and in the streets. She applies her research and publications about performance history and critical race and cultural studies and spectatorship to a range of cultural artifacts, artworks, and performances. At Hofstra, she teaches courses in performance history, women's and LGBTQ studies, performance art, nonverbal communication, performance and healing, visual rhetoric, gender and intercultural issues and communication, spectatorship, and others. And she has staged historic performances, reenactments during all three presidential debates at Hofstra, uh, from 2008 to, to 2016. Professor Merrill has published widely in the US and UK. She was awarded the Callaway Prize for her biography, where When Romeo Was a Woman, Charlotte Cushman and Her Circle of Female Spectators, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship in 20, excuse me, 22, 20, 2002, a visiting fellowship institute for advanced study at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. In 2010-2011, she was awarded the Eccles Center Visiting Professorship in North American Studies at the British Library for Performing Race and Reading Antebellum American Bodies. In 2016, Professor Merrill was awarded the Brockett Prize for the Most Fitting Companions, Making Mixed Race Bodies Visible in the Antebellum Public Spaces. Uh, she was a visiting scholar at the Institute for Black Atlantic Research, UCLan, England in 2016 and spring of 2021. And her es essay, Amalgamation, Moral Geography and Slum Tourism, Irish and African Americans Sharing Space on the Streets and Stages of Antebellum, New York, um, was published in Fanula Sweeney's All in Ireland, Slavery, Anti-Slavery and Empire in 2018. Uh, in the UK, Professor Merrill has delivered invited keynote lectures, sp specular specularizing, spectacularizing, I always say that wrong, uh, Black Bodies on 19th Century Stages for the International Museum of the Study of Slavery in Liverpool, England, and the keynote lecture, Sounding Anti-Slavery Voices in Antebellum Spaces, for the revisiting the Black Atlantic Conference Gender, Race, and Performance, the University of Liverpool in 2019. She recently worked on Turner Prize winning artist Lubaina Hamid's Memorial to Zong. Um, it's part of an exhibition at the Lancaster Maritime Museum. And she is a contributor to the Tate ca exhibition catalog for this exhibition of Lubaina Hamid at the, the, that is currently on view at the Tate Modern in London. So Professor Merrill, welcome. She is joining us from London live. So we hope we don't have any computer glitches, but so Lisa, welcome. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So if you'd like to go ahead and share yours. Okay. Um, uh, and just, just a little housekeeping first. We're going to keep you on mute while she's doing her presentation. You can certainly ask questions in the chat, and we'll have plenty of time after the presentation for questions and answers. And this, again, this program is being recorded. So if you, just in case you uh, would like to turn off your video feed. Okay. Um, well, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, both to be in London and to be talking and sharing with um, 
friends, colleagues, students, um, and other guests, um, both in the US and in the UK. I, I saw in the lineup that some of my colleagues and friends on both uh, continents are on today. So I'm really happy to be here. And I'm happy to share with you the experience of this really remarkable um, exhibit that's happening now at the Tate Modern Gallery. Um, so I'm going to take you with me virtually. Um, we wish I could have you in my pocket and um, take you in person to this amazing show, um, large show of eight rooms of the wonderful artist Lubaina Hamid. And I'm, I'm trusting that you guys can all see my screen. Um, so this is the opening. When we go to the beginning of Tate Modern, you have your ticket, you have your virtual ticket with me now, and you see me at this opening with the artist herself. Um, this was the private showing before the whole opening. And so there I am with um, Lubaina and some of the work that we're gonna talk about here that I'm happy to be sharing with you this very exciting time. Um, I was introduced to Lubaina's work um, at the, um, the it, in Preston actually, and I think one of my colleagues is on here as well, um, the director of um, UCLAN's Institute for Black Atlantic Research, Alan Rice, I think you're on too. Um, and I met Lubaina, um, and Alan in that context. And one of the things I've always been drawn to is the sense of, um, and you see here this quote of Lubaina's, that she's, she doesn't only see herself as a painter, but as a political strategist using visual language to encourage conversation, argument, and change. I'm a performance historian. And as a performance historian, the sense of dialogue, um, conversation, dialogue, and embodied connection between spectators and the work that they see before them is key to all of the work that I do and has drawn me to Lubaina's work in a very particular way. So I'm going to share with you just some of the images from this ongoing show because as I said it's eight rooms of remarkable, remarkable um, artwork. So some of the pieces have been exhibited. Um, you know, she's had a nice long career and in many different places. So what you see before you now are um, some of the work that was exhibited, some of you may have seen in New York um, when Lubaina had a one woman show at the New Museum in 2019. And I put these two images up um, to share with you because their meanings, um, as with all art and performance and history change in the context, change with the spectators. And these powerful images, now that we are in our COVID moment, allowing for short breaks and ensuring sufficient space mean even more than they meant at the um, beginning of seeing this work uh, initially at the New Museum. Much of Lubaina's work is done in collaboration with um, a partner that she's working with, um, Magda Starsbeski um, Bevan. And this work in New York also had the sound underneath it as it does in the Tate. And I'll mention some more of the soundscapes um, that Lubaina and Magda have come up with together so that you can imagine as a spectator hearing Lubaina's voice. And hopefully at the end of today's program, you'll get to hear her voice them as well. Um, here's a, a, a shot of one of the many rooms in the gallery in the Tate. And as you imagine walking with me as we are perambulating through the exhibit, this exhibit is choreographed by Lubaina's art and its placement. And so we'll talk about some of these pieces individually, the carts, um, these wonderful um, pieces, that represent Old Boat and New Money. Here you'll see um, some of the, the work here. This is Freedom and Change. This is 
between the two, my heart is balanced. We'll talk about all of them, but I wanted you to have a kind of long shot uh, as you imagine being in one of the rooms of this large gallery space with me right now and realize that every choice that was made is not only the work of Lubanus that we're talking about, but I want to have you experience the performativity of this work. Um, thinking of the spectator as I do in the terms of um, the theater practitioner, the Chilean theater practitioner, Augusto Ball, as a spect actor and Lubana's work as a prompt, as the set of scenarios for the live enactment of a dialogue. So we're doing a virtual ver version of that here today. And I'll close up on some of the pieces. This piece, Freedom and Change, is from 1984. And uh, it belongs to the Tate. So, uh -huh. Yes? Is there a problem? No, you're OK, Lisa. Oh, OK, sorry. I thought I heard an um, interruption there. OK. Um, so this piece <clears throat> is a life-size um, piece that has the images of two women, um, two beautiful black women with clasped hands running in a free way outside of the curtain bed sheet that, um, that they're, they're um, represented on. And with these cutout figures, and you'll see Lubana uses cutout figures a lot that exceed the frame. So what we have here is we're drawn into this and almost like, again, my work is very theatrical. So these are intentionally like shadow puppets um, because they're intentionally not clear, but patchworked here. And it's as though we are seeing them live and these dogs are, are pulling them along. Um, for the theater historians here, I, um, some of Lubena's work has been an intentional recasting of other works, other um, historical works. And, you know, as a, a performance historian, I'm always drawn by the fact that history is always changing. Um, it's, not, it's not set in stone. It changes as more adaptation, as more information comes. And here, what I've put alongside this, this Picasso is not in the show, but this Picasso of two women running on the beach with clasped hands has been completely reconfigured to celebrate these two black women. Um, and so uh, on a couple of occasions, Lubena has taken historical images and done very dramatically different things with them. So as we encounter these images in the Tate show, some of us may have come as all spectators to performance with a history that um, reverberates so that the, the historical frame is there as well as the embodied experience that we have with this lovely, lovely work. Um, you can see Lubaina doing that probably most notably in this large installation here below. Um, this is Lubaina's installation that I'm going to talk about quite a bit called A Fashionable Marriage. And Lubaina Hamid started out as a theater designer. So the use of theatricality is one of the things that, you know, we've been talking about for several years now. These are life-size cutouts and they have been exhibited in a number of different ways. But what I've put on top here is the Hogarth um, painting that is also actually on view in uh, another part of the Tate, the Tate Britain right now. And Lubaina and I went to look at this together and it just, um, you know, always amuses me to see what she did, what she did with these images. Um, and what she staged and what she staged for live spectators to interact with. So in the Hogarth, there are, there were only two black figures. You see them here, there as in much 18th and 19th century and earlier art, when black figures appear, they're often in a servile um, role and capacity. 
Lubaina, of course, has completely transformed that. And the life-size cutouts here, um, when there is a, a, in the Hogarth, the lover and the countess have been transformed, remember it's 1984, to um, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. And all of the, that represents, oh, let me go back a slide for you. Um, in the corner here, you see this, this character who was not highlighted at all in the Hogarth, but Lubaina has, has mentioned that this young girl figure is really the key to the whole installation for her. Um, this figure has sitting upon luggage, has traveled, uses the books for taking her um, and transforming the art scene that is being depicted in the larger piece. And let me give you more of a sense of that here. Um, so you can't really see the size dimensions, but these are more than life-size figures. And one of the things that is so important to me looking at our interaction with Lubana's work is to imagine the set that she has staged for us as though we are the co-actors in that set. Um, we talk a lot, Lubain and I, about the issue of front stage and backstage performance. This is a key aspect of um, performance theory and the way one prepares for the performance backstage. Also the sense of the tableau vivants that are um, pre present here and what it would feel like to be part of this installation. In different times, that this whole installation has been put together. It has been presented sometimes so that spectators, spect actors can actually walk through it as though they were on stage with these figures, the figure of the white um, feminist artist. You see the, um, the images there, the figure of the critic. This is only part of it that you see in, in this picture here. The, the large, towering, powerful black woman artist who, who really is center stage here and who I've written about quite a bit in the catalog um, piece and who's very instrumental in this whole scenario, which is a statement about the art movement in Britain and the way Black women artists were and were not treated um, that are, is being depicted here. And so I wanted you to have a sense of that. Um, at the Tate, the scenario is set up so that we can't walk among it. We can't walk behind it. Um, but we can be in the wings. And so I've taken these photos to show you how much the theatricality of being in the wings as a stage performer feels the magic of what that's like. And as Lubena has said, the magic is when you see how it works. So she very intentionally has um, the backgrounds here so that it looks as though these, these are um, part of a theater setup and we are there with them um, at the tape. We can just look in, we can gaze in, in the wings, in different displays. People have been able to move around this amazing large uh, setup. At the Tate exhibit, close to the setup is of fashionable marriage. And um, there's so much more to say about this, uh, but hopefully when we take questions, we'll, we'll go on further about that. Um, but I wanted to give you an overview of, of uh, a number of the pieces and some of the work that I've written about, um, again, in terms of the embodiment that Lubaina has choreographed are this more recent series called Men in Drawers. And so set up near in the Tate as we walk past or alongside Fashionable Marriage, we see men in drawers. And this exhibit um, has been really important to Lubaina because the surprise of what you find in a drawer, 
um, the, the things that have been lost or forgotten is key to what prompted her uh, to take that on. And there are, are several of these in the exhibit. And I, I just took these photos so that you see some of them are positioned horizontally. So you look in as though you're looking in a drawer with me, with Lubena, and finding these faces, these remarkable faces looking back at you. Um, the two that, that are here are the first is the man in a pencil drawer, and this is the man in a paper drawer. Um, in my article um, chapter in the catalog, I talk about these also in terms of early photography and the way a photographic plate just appears in a box that is similar to the box that we encounter when we meet the men in drawers and gaze in. And again, if you think about putting your body in space and looking in the drawer and finding what has surprised you, you'll have a sense of what it's like to encounter those. The next slide I'm gonna share with you to give you a sense of, of the exhibit again, has a very embodied <clears throat> sense to it. And um, again, in my um, essay for the catalog, I talk a lot about the feast wagons. And these wagons, obviously everything on the wall are works of Lubanus as well, <clears throat> but these wagons were part of an exhibit Lubaina did with Susan Walsh, and they staged a performative procession through the streets of Preston and Durham with these carts. And one of the things that was that they were looking at then was thinking about so many people who had been displaced and what it would mean to have your whole life have to be in a cart that you carry around with you, the experience of refugees um, is part of what inspired um, Lubena and Susan to do this particular um, set of works. And I remember when she was first talking about making these carts um, several years ago, quite a few years ago now, uh, just trying to envision what that was like. Again, from my performance history, background, I know that um, one of the earliest forms of Western theater, and some of you online may know this, were the pageant wagons that were wagons larger than these, but wagons upon which were staged biblical stories and that went through the streets of most European cities. And again, think about the embodiment of spectators. You move out of the way, the cart is coming towards you, um, you see what's inside. What's inside these are um, images of animals, sometimes um, forms, creatures that are seen as monstrous or dangerous. Um, and people are connected to what they see moving through them as they move through these spaces. In different displays before this Tate exhibit, part of what um, people had the opportunity to do and Lubaina wanted them to do was to have spect actors move these carts themselves. So imagine if you could be in a gallery space and encounter the carts and not only have to move around them, perambulate and um, go through the spaces, but find a way to make a statement in your own movement and the movement, the choreography of those. Of course, at the tape, these are, there's a slight um, barrier. Nobody can actually touch them, but we can imagine what it was like to be moving through space in that way as we move around them. Movement is important to me also when we look at this beautiful painting, um, what, one of the um, paintings of hers that's probably best known, these two black women in the boat in um, between the two, my heart is balanced. And like much of Lubaina's work, there is water surrounding um, or water in part of the images. We'll, we'll talk about that and the way issues of enslavement and history enter into so much of her work. But 
what's significant here to me, um, again, is that we are in the boat with these women. So we are between the two. <laughs> and perhaps it's our hearts that are balanced. And whether this is a map or um, looking at the conversation between them, we are in the boat with them. This is one of the um, works that Lubaina has recast a historical painting as well in this very powerful, beautiful way. And the historical painting that was recast um, is the James Tussaud Portsmouth Dockyard painting um, of 1877 around there. And you see, of course, one of the things that has happened in Lubaina's wonderful work is that the soldier is completely gone. <laughs> the man that is um, in between these two women whose relationships to each other are not clear is out of the picture entirely. Um, but even in the Tussauds, the perspective and point of view makes the spectator part of the scene. And that's one of the things that was so remarkable about Between the Two, My Heart is Balanced. And when you see it live, you are there, you're, you're in it with them. And, and you are feeling that balance, which is wonderful. Um, another one of the more recent paintings that looks again at um, representations of relationship and Lubaina talks about all of her work as scenarios. Um, and one of the things that's really remarkable about the Tate exhibition is that she presents questions for spectators, but doesn't give a lot of background. And that is intentional, I think, in a wonderful performative way in that the spectator has to interpret and analyze the scene. Who are these men? What are they doing in this ball on shipboard? What's happened before? And what might be happening now as, this man comes up, who is looking at whom, what are their relationships. So as you are a spectator at the show, you are also a, a co-collaborator of a sort. And um, you bring your own history, of course, as we do to all performance and art endeavors to that moment. Um, one of the things I wanna to highlight here also is the fact that once again, we're on shipboard, there is water. And um, water is very important in Lubaina's work. And um, water, oh, sorry, <laughs> I skipped ahead a bit. Um, okay, and in this piece too, this part of the Roder series, um, we see water over here. And, and water is also a significant part, of course, of the Horace of the Middle Passage. And the Roder series um, casts that in a very mysterious light for spectators. Um, for those who come to this exhibit, knowing the, the name Le Roder, may know that this is a slave ship and it's a ship in which the, both the crew, the enslavers, and the captives were afflicted with a disease that blinded them. And Lubin has talked about the horrors of that, um, you know, just feeling as an artist, what would be the horror of blindness for us as spectators, the horror of blindness. Um, but the mystery of the Roder series that we see here is, again, she's not trying to replicate 1819 for us. She's not trying to give us a representation of what happened um, to the, the people who were captive in the boat. Some of them were thrown to their deaths in the sea after you know uh, um, becoming blind. Instead, there are modern clothing here. And there's a mystery and tension about who these figures are about the head on this woman, about what's happening with this man, about where touch is, how hands operate. What would it be like to be in such uncertainty that you don't know where you are, what the time period is? Um, she's very intentional about 
letting us, we spectators, make the scene for ourselves. Um, and, and that's where we are with, um, there are several paintings in the Rodeo series. This is the one that um, I will hold up the catalog later so that you can see it. It's a part of this that becomes the catalog cover. Um, and is replicated all over London. You see images of this um, fabulous, mysterious piece. And the, the suggestion of what is out there and what they've experienced inside. And we are inside with them. Um, that's part of the choreography there. I wanted to give you a close up as we talk about the importance of water, the history of enslavement to some of the not representational pieces of um, Lubainus as well. And this, um, unfortunately, it's a bad photograph of mine. Um, I was trying to give you a sense of the distance. There are much better photographs of this wonderful piece, Old Boat, New Money, um, where there are, you, you can see the shells, um, you can imagine the wave that the planks represent here, but even more significant for those of us, um, you now virtually, me actually, when we're seeing and experiencing Old Boat New Money, we hear the sounds of the sea. We hear water lapping, we hear the creak of the boat, we can imagine ourselves aboard the boat, and which boat is it? that we are experiencing. The sound in all of Lubaina's work, not every piece has a sound component, but there is sound throughout the show. And that has um, been marvelously crafted in collaboration with Lubaina by um, Magda Stwarskowska Bevan. And Magda's work is really, brings us another embodied level to um, experiencing Lubaina's art because sound, um, and Lubaina's been key to use sound quite a bit, but their work together and sound is such an intimate connection because although looking at things, whether they're staged before us, whether we're walking among them, whether we're being choreographed, it's our bodies moving, but sound enters into us. The intimacy of sound is there. And I'd love you to be able to imagine being at this show with me because in the different parts of each room, you'll hear different sounds and some of them overlap and some of them are very distinct. So even if you go back to thinking about um, fashionable marriage, there is a whole soundscape there. Um, they're just, the sound part is really remarkable. And this is very carefully crafted by uh, Magda and Lubaina to decide not only what sounds to um, infiltrate our bodies, but what they are up against, where we'll hear them, whether we hear them up high and down low, all of that is very carefully crafted. Uh, I wanted to share with you also, um, another less representational um, piece of Lubaina's work. And this is the Jelly Mold Pavilion um, exhibit. And this um, Lubaina did for Liverpool in 2010. And I don't know if you can see these as close-ups here, but jelly molds for the US, we might call them jello molds take the sugar, and of course sugar is part of um, what motivated and maintained the slave trade. And in Lubaina's imagining here, she's thinking about what, what if we had monuments that were in the large shape of these jelly molds? And I don't know if you can see, but um, imagine the size of a tree, the size of a figure, and imagine coming across these like small amphitheaters. And these are painted with representations of different African countries. There are beautiful African figures. And Lubena's exhibit is filled with questions for spectators. The question here is, what are monuments for? And this work of monument and, and commemoration is something that 
um, she and I have talked about quite a bit. Um, some of my students who are on here know that in um, looking at Alan Rice's work on creating memorials, we've talked about um, guerrilla commemoration. That's Alan Rice's term. And here, this question of monuments. What, what do monuments serve? Who are monuments for? is key to what looks like a very small exhibit, but is enormously powerful. And so I'm very pleased that Lubain and I have been talking a lot about doing more work about uh, monuments, some of the monuments that are in the streets in London. And we've walked through some of those and stay tuned because sometime in the spring, we'll be doing more about um, the whole monument experience. But I wanted you to see that and imagine coming up to these. Imagine thinking that you could play with them, that you could move them around. Again, it's that embodied experience. When um, Lubaina did this exhibit in Liverpool, they were um, located in three very different spaces and people encountered them at various places in the city and tried to imagine, oh, sorry, them, them there. Okay, so now we're moving towards some of the things that I have loved that are not in the exhibit. So part of the virtual experience that you have here today is to see more of Lubaina's work, but what in this enormous exhibit, and her work is literally all over the world, what is not here, but is so key and part of it. Um, so what you see here is this amazing painting, um, Memorial to Zong that as you see Lubaina painted in 1991, as she imagined a monument. Again, monumentality is really important um, in my work as well. Some of you online are staging your own performances at the site of public art, and that's a lot of what I do. Lubaina here has imagined a memorial to people who were enslaved on the ship Zong. And um, as some of you may know, the horrors of that particular, of all enslavement, of course, but particularly the slave ship Zong, um, the slave captains claimed that there was not enough water. In fact, that wasn't accurate, but they threw overboard in 1781, 132 enslaved people thrown overboard to their deaths. And in imagining a memorial to those people, these are Lebanese words about imagining a fountain, a monument, a memorial to people for water, for water to people wasted in water, wasted for water. And again, she doesn't choose to represent the horrors of that of that slave ship, but what would it be to imagine a monument here that would have the circle of water and have it framed through the spout with this beautiful black man's face on it? Um, this, oh, let me go back to that for a sec. As you see, or I guess I say in the next one, this painting now um, is exhibited in Lancaster, um, in the north of England, at the Lancaster Maritime Museum. And I was so pleased to be invited to give um, a talk about that. Again, this is during, was during lockdown. So at first I couldn't do it live. Um, and here's, you get the sense of the size of the piece um, and, and being masked, of course, in the gallery. But what the lovely people at the Lancaster um, Maritime Museum did, and this is the show that Alan Rice curated, what they did was ask um, those of us who were participating in this show, Memorial to Zong, to give the experience of that work. And so there's a very brief clip, um, because I wasn't able to be there live at first, that I wanted to just share with you to give you the sense of what it feels like to be there. So this is just about two minutes. Hi, I'm Lisa Merrill. I'm here with you virtually at the Lancaster Maritime Museum for Lubaina Hamid's Memorial to Zong exhibit. 
a monument or memorial is always in dialogue with its place and space and time. And here in Lancaster at what was the fourth largest slave port in Britain, this tribute to the Middle Passage captives, particularly those 132 who were jettisoned into the ocean in the horrors of the slave ship song you will have heard of from others at this exhibit. But today I look with you at this painting, this painting here acknowledging this horrific event that took place 240 years ago, but the memorial that we see before us now. Lubena Hamid's Memorial to Zong. Look at it with me. Green blue water surrounding everything. Water is life and death to the drowned enslaved captives from the slave ship Zong. Looking up at this memorial from the ground, the plinth, the pillar, the column teeters as on a slant. It's angle determined by the spectator's position in space, in politics, in privilege. Placed atop, you see a black man's face and upper body painted on a jug, spewing water from its spout, its mouth, reminding us viewers of whose bodies were made into commodities and at what cost for 132 humans tossed to their death into the sea. Droplets escape the frame we see, escape the frame of history, call us back to this monument imagined. The memorial is a font, a spray, a spring. In front of a pedestal, we see a banner or sail unfurled, revealing the workings that siphon water up from some invisible source. And here is a basin to catch it. The cycle draws up and drains down again and again. On the Zong, the murderous enslavers claimed there was a lack of fresh water water they denied the sick and black captives whom they tossed to their death. On the third day of this murderous rampage, rainwater filled the buckets and basins on board flowing. There was always enough fresh water. But greed turned humans into cargo, calculating the worth of bodies into pounds how to honor them, to remember this history in blue green water, reveal it, a fountain imagined. Lubaina shows us here, out of the mouths of the drowned, spitting, spraying, reminding viewers outside the frame at the fountain's foot, whose lives we drink in. Daily. So I wanted to give you guys there um, a sense of what it's like to be to be there with Lube and his work um, and how embodied it is. Uh, and I just wish you could all be there. Um, this is another remarkable, this will be the, the end of, of our introduction here. But this is a remarkable, remarkable um, installation exhibit of Lubanus um, called Naming the Money. And again, the cost of enslavement um, is part of the history that, um, that we see here and that we move among. So in Naming the Money, there are a hundred, Lubaina painted a hundred life-size, and even larger than life size, you see walking among them, um, figures of enslaved people. And each of them has a story 
that she's created. Um, and this exhibit, um, this was uh, an, an exhibit um, prior to the Tate. This has been exhibited numerous times, but um, when I was there to see it, I was so moved not only by these incredible images, but by the narratives that she has presented for us. Um, so what we hear as we walk through this incredible exhibit are things like, oh, sorry, we've gone to the wrong place here. What we hear are the narratives um, that she's created, a five sentence story for each of these figures. So in one case, this will just give you a sample. We will hear Lubaina's voice saying, my name is Ngoba. They call me Sissy. I used to make counters to predict the future. Now I make dice for their games, but I can still see what's coming. Each of these hundred figures has a name, a home name, a name given them by the enslavers, by the colonizers, um, and an activity, a thing they have done um, before their enslavement, the things that they are doing now, and their strategies for survival. Strategy for survival is such an important part of Lubaina's work. Um, so she not only gives us some of the glimpses of the suggestions of the horrors of the past and its reverberation and continuation in, the, in our present as we walk in here among it, but also the strategies for survival for um, Black people, for oppressed people, but particularly looking at race and what people have to do just to survive. Um, what you see, so here you see the, um, in naming the money, each of those stories is on a packing crate behind the figure. And again, she wants us always to see what's behind something, the backstage, so that we can be part of it and not be taken in by illusion, but understand presentation and our role in it. Now, the reason I included this besides loving this work, this remarkable work, um, is that at the end of the Tate exhibit, the sounds of Lubaina's voice giving us these hundred narratives and a music that infiltrates those narratives are played. And it's played against a very unusual installation um, a bicycle shelter and a smoking shelter that are used now um, where workers might be bicycle messengers, where people who are taking a smoking break might smoke cigarettes, of course, tobacco and the history of tobacco is part of that. None of these figures are in the Tate exhibit, but all of their narratives are there. And along with their narratives, Lubaina has questions, as I said, in each of the rooms. But the last question is, do you want an easy life? Imagine hearing the stories of a hundred enslaved lives imagined, created by Lubaina, and then encountering what would it mean to have an easy life? Do we want an easy life? At whose cost? With what history? whose interests are served. All of those questions are present, are in our bodies as we experience this. So I'm going to stop my share now so that I can be back with you as you look at this wonderful work. And um, what I'd like to do, uh, I've asked Karen to help with this. Um, and I do wanna shout out before I, I um, turn to something else to shout out not only to the wonders and thank Karen and Hofstra Museum of Art, Hofstra University Museum of Art, but also I'm very honored to be on the board at Hofstra, the Center for Race, Culture and Social Justice. 
and their sponsorship of today's talk as well, because I see you present here and I'm so pleased that I can um, be sharing this work thanks to, um, thanks to their wonderful support as well. And of course, the Cultural Center um, at Hofstra University and the magnificent Ethelene Collins who makes everything happen. So I'm so pleased um, to, be, to be sharing this with you under those auspices and to know some of my UCLan friends are here as well um, and some of my Hofstra students and some of my old childhood friends are there. So I'm very pleased. What I'd like to, um, to end my, this part uh, with um, is some of you may have already had the opportunity to see, but um, Lubaina was interviewed. I'd love you to hear her voice. And her voice and dialogue is so, and conversation is so important to her. And last week um, when I, I met up with her and she had just come from an interview with um, CNN's Christian Amanpour. And so um, Karen has kindly put the link for that interview here. And I'd like you to hear some of Lubaina talking about her own work because um, there's nothing like hearing from the artist herself. So Karen, can you um, key that for us and, and play some of it? Yes, and I put the link in the chat. So if you need to see it, we're going to play a little bit for you. I made the paintings, but they're conversations with audiences. So I want you to go in that room and understand that you have agency. Mm -hmm. Meaning what exactly? What should an audience do to embrace the invitation that you're offering them? Well, rather than look at the work and admire it, as you sometimes do in an art exhibition, you go in the room and ask yourself what this reminds you of, what uh, it makes you want to do. Um, those sorts of questions. Uh, not so much why is she doing this thing, but how can I enter into this scenario? I read that you said that art is all well and good, but it's not as if what you're painting exists in a silent vacuum. The, the, the boat, you'll hear the oars, you'll hear the sea. So sound is incredibly important for you as, as the life force around you. It is. I mean, it's around us all the time. We're walking down the street, we're hearing all kinds of different sounds, different voices, different music. And it doesn't, it seems to me that an exhibition, why would it be different than that? Um, and a lot of the time I want the sound that's coming out into the gallery to encourage you to listen to the conversations you're having in your head. So there's a sort of three-way thing going on. Um, even the sound is trying to encourage you to feel and think about yourself and your actions and your memories. You were the oldest and the first black female artist to win the Turner Prize in 2017. How has that changed the way you work or the way your work is received? Well, in a way it hasn't changed the way I work, but I suppose it did make me more daring. I guess I, I won the prize when I was 63 and I kind of knew that there were not 63 years in front of me, knowing there were 63 years behind me. So I absolutely understood that I have to make the most of the years ahead. So take any risks I could and keep going, really. So that made a difference. So there's sort of no room for pondering, resting. I just want to make things, try things, work with other people and see what happens. So I want to talk to you about um, your work a, a very a, a fashionable marriage okay so that's cutouts yeah and what year was it done uh originally i mean i this happens to me because it's such a long time ago but in 1987 okay so yeah you were daring in 1987 it didn't yeah. take you the turner prize to be daring because <laughs> this is a really political piece you have um ronald reagan and this was in the 80s when the whole idea of nuclear armageddon was terrifying the world you have margaret thatcher who was prime minister um at the time what are you saying because i understood that there was a lot of backlash in fact you left london i did 
<laughs> <laughs> well, I, what it was saying, I mean, basically what it was saying was that the art world is exactly the same as this political world. Don't kid yourself in museums or art galleries that you're special and liberal. Because to us black artists, you're behaving in exactly the same way. Ignoring us, doing damage to us, and not being interested in, the, in, in, in any of the things we're saying. And that was a pretty mm, uh, difficult thing for people to hear. And yeah, a lot of people didn't like it. What did they say? Oh, well, I suppose, I suppose art world people at the time, critics, uh, curators thought that they were being supportive, but they were being, you know, patronizing and giving us tiny crumbs. And I guess at the time, I was in my early 30s, I expected more, I wanted more, I was more ambitious for all of us, and I wanted to make a difference, and I had the nerve to be that bold, um, and I didn't care. But yeah, I did think, oh, well, I'll just leave because I can't be bothered with this argument. I just want to keep making work. So you left and you went to Northern England. Yeah, yeah. But here we are, you're back in a big way. <laughs> yes. I mean, you're having the last laugh, right? I hope so. <laughs> the marriage work also took a little bit from the painter Hogarth. Yeah, absolutely. Who is currently, right now, yeah. on exhibition at the other Tate, Tate Britain. There's a painting in the series Fashionable Marriage um, it's the Countess's Morning Levee, and I've, I've really copied it person for person and translated it into the 1980s. Why? Well, Hogarth was laughing at everybody, vicious to everybody, um, oh, I'm a bit of a bitter man, I suppose, but really interested in exposing political hypocrisy. You're not, at least it doesn't come across in your paintings, as a bitter woman, a bitter or sarcastic, um, devastating kind of artist because your paintings seem to be full of joy and even though you're taking on very difficult subjects, mm. you are not, for instance, in, is it called the Rodeur Exchange? Mm -hmm, yeah. You don't paint the victims of that, 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 that event. You paint something very different. Tell me about the Rodeur and, and how you decided to portray it. Okay, well, I suppose I wanted to examine what, first of all, what terrifies me as an artist, and that would be losing my sight. What would terrify an art audience? Losing their sight, because they obviously adore looking at visual things. So that is lurking there in this scenario. The story of the Rodeur was a, was a French uh, slave ship that took uh, captured Africans from the west coast of Africa on the way to the Caribbean. And in, in that horrific journey, many, many, many of the crew and all of the captured Africans lost their sight. Let's see, oh, sorry. Uh, was it, no, no, it was a virus or what happened? Yes, a, an eye infection. It ravaged through um, the entire, um, I suppose, cargo immediately. And this seemed to me to be absolutely horrific and terrifying. And, but what I'm trying to say in, in these paintings is that the vibrations, the traces, the dust, the, the heat of that still surrounds us. So those people in that room with the sea outside, looking elegant but disconnected, they're kind of feeling that true story, understanding that they don't feel quite right because they are the descendants of, the, of some of the survivors of that. You know, when they reached the Caribbean, okay, you've done that journey, goodness knows how, you've gone blind, you've survived it, and then you're a slave. Hmm. <laughs> it seems to me horror upon horror. So there's no point in painting that, because you or I would come into that gallery and be horrified and overwhelmed by that. One thing you just said is quite stunning. You said those who survived, if they hadn't been thrown overboard, hmm. the others were thrown overboard? Yes, that happened a lot. Um, 
sometimes the ship's captain would feel that maybe the fresh water supply was uh, low. So rather than um, endanger his crew, he would throw uh, captured Africans overboard to, um, you know, save the water supply. That was what was written down. But I think that many historians feel that if there was any sign of insurrection, any sign of... Disease? Know, yes, then let's chuck them overboard. But of course, that was kind of dangerous because they were worth a lot of money. So the insurance claim found a lot of these things out because, of course, everything is accounted for. You're from Zanzibar. Your father mm. was from Zanzibar. And yeah. you're quoted as saying, you know, I was born into tragedy. I'm paraphrasing, but my birth also was tragedy. That's yeah. because your father passed away very early. Yes, I was uh, four months old. And my father, who got malaria every year in that kind of way that uh, you can and you do and you get it every year and you, you know you have a you feel ill for a bit and then you're okay again and that particular year um, when I was four, four months old he got it particularly badly uh, and died um, and my English mother she had the choice she could have stayed there with me she could have left me there with my African family or she could bring me to England and she decided that's what she wanted to do. When you look back, was coming here to the UK, did it provide you with a land of opportunity and would it have been different had you stayed in Africa? Would you have been this artist? When you think back? I think if I'd stayed, I probably would have ended up designing Kangas, I suspect. I still feel... Kangas? Uh, the um, African cloths. Uh, that I uh, use a lot in my paintings to talk about um, conversations between women, really. Um, I think I would have ended up uh, being a textile designer like my mother, but in, a, but in that kind of context. Um, I suspect, like in every young um, person's life, there's encouragement to be a doctor or a lawyer, but I don't think that would have happened to me. <laughs> You do paint on sort of a lot of different surfaces. Yeah. It's not just canvas, right? I know. Okay. I, I, would, I know we don't love to hear her talk more, but I want to leave some time for us to have questions and answers. Sure. Um, so if anybody has a question, you can put it in the chat. Let me just go back and look at the chat um, to comment about, they love the interview, excellent about her sharing her own, her own ideas in person. That was really great. Um, the link to the video is in the chat. Somebody asked me to, to post that. It is in the chat if you want that. So does anybody have a specific, a specific question for Lisa or comment that they'd like, something she'd like to, you'd like to hear more about? Um, Somebody would like to know, can you speak on the types of materials Lubaina uses in her art? Oh, wow. <laughs> she started to talk about it, and that's when I cut her off, sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. I think you need to, um, to listen to Lubaina talking about <laughs> because she uses so much. Um, and, and I think one of the things that's remarkable is they are paintings, they are, you know, I, I love the cutouts, the life-size cutouts, the carts, the planks that are the boat. Um, there's a whole room that I didn't mention um, called the Blue Grid Room that is part of the show where she takes patterns and different shades of the color blue and has it circle the whole room. And while it is circling, again, sound is so key to this particular, um, the blue grid uh, piece. And so um, some of the blues go over instruments, go over wooden planks um, that, as I said, they surround you as you hear Lubaina, um, sometimes speaking Flemish. <laughs> and sometimes this was shown originally in Belgium and sometimes in French and in English, and you hear some music that is suggestive of, you know, the, well, lots of music, but also the Joni Mitchell, not the words, but the sound, few sounds to the um, part of that incredible 
song Blue. Um, so you just hear a few bars of it. Um, but again, if you know that, or if you imagine yourself being surrounded, uh, that's part of it. The other thing that I didn't say that I talk about more in my, um, in my essay is the way she uses text. She uses questions. So there are words, not typical gallery descriptions of when something was done or what the artist might have intended, but instead words to prompt the spect actor, you know, that's what I have brought to it, this, this um, sense from Augusto Boal, that spectators have an active role. And so we are being addressed by Lubaina's artwork. We're also being addressed by the texts that she uses. And in this way, some of her influences, when I talk about the carts in the essay, I also talk about Brecht, um, Bertolt Brecht, the playwright, who was um, very influential to her political playwright um, and one who was very dear to my heart. And the carts reminded me of Brecht's mother Courage, who, you know, in the wartime has taken everything in her carts. Um, so that sense, this is a great question. I don't know who asked it, but it's a great question. But the thing um, to remember is that Lubaina sees the opportunity to do all of it. There's sometimes, uh, a couple of years ago, she asked me to send her copies of the New York Times and she did things on The Guardian and The New York Times and painted over them. Um, she's got a hundred pieces of a China service um, that was exhibited in Lancaster and totally changes the meaning of the privilege of that kind of material um, and instead gets people to see the history of enslavement. So there's, uh, you can imagine, Lubaina has brought her vision to so many different contexts. And I think that it's very clear that she is very, that interaction, she really wants this, the visitor to interact with her work. I think that's very evident in what she's done. And I think the use of the whole variety of materials really makes it an experience when you're there, which I think, as, as I always say, it's much better to be in person looking at artwork than to do it virtually. Um, and I think that in her case, it's, because it is an experience being there, right? because of the space, because of the sound, because of the other people that you'd be interacting with, that that makes it a very different case with her in particular. Yeah, and yeah. I, just wanna, I just wanna add to that, that I think part of um, my conversations over the years with her really are informed by exactly what you're saying, Karen, and also my performance background, you know, because when you go into a theater, um, as anybody who does any kind of performance work knows, every particular performance is different. It's a dialogue with audience. Even if the audience doesn't say anything, they've come in at a particular moment in time, they're in a specific context, they are part of the dialogue. And um, that is really how I see people um, interacting with artwork in general, but with Lubaina intentionally, and mm -hmm. having started as a theater designer, that sense of what does, what's the spectator's role in that? Um, and she has said, you know, the audience is the most important person in the room. And um, the way I have described it is these wonderful works of art are prompts. They are Lubaina's gift to the spectators in the room. They prompt us to think about our own lives, they prompt us to think about the past and what has been erased, what she says invisibilized, particularly in terms of black history and um, histories of enslavement. And they, they are part of a dialogue that is an ever-changing dialogue. So the embodied part of that conversation is really key. Yeah. Um, anybody else have any questions? I don't see any more questions in the chat. If anybody wants to raise their hand and just ask a question, we could do that too. Oh, I see that. I see that. Yes. Yes. That's Ron Jansen. Yes. 
Um, absolutely, humor, it's a great question. Humor is a big part of um, Lubena's work. Um, and, and you see sometimes the irony, um, sometimes outright um, the satire, the large installation of fashionable marriage um, is, is hysterical as well as, you know, very poignant in terms of the way black women artists were being treated. Um, so yes, humor is a big part of it. And the juxtaposition of things. I mean, I think that that is always a big part of humor, right? Yeah. That sense of juxtaposition. And you see that in many of the choices that she makes. Yeah. Okay. And Alan has a question. So you should be, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry to go live. I just, I just got fed up typing several hundred <laughs> words. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. That's a wonderful talk. Um, Thank you. I, I was wanting to sort of think about promenade because I know you've worked on promenade, and I was I was very struck when we were at the at Tate Modern, the way in which mm -hmm. Labena kind of has us all promenading through those spaces in particular ways, and yes. and 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 making us kind of. Make, make, making us engage as we move in kind of ways which felt very much like a performance rather than a, uh, mm -hmm. a static artwork. And I was just wondering whether you, with your kind of performance art, because I, I never tried to theorise or think about this, but suddenly I was kind of thinking mm -hmm. about it very much on that last yeah. week when we were at the Tate at the opening. So I just wonder whether you, you'd been able to process it and think about it or whether using your wonderful scholarship from 19th century promenade, <laughs> that, yep. that might be a way into it. Yes, thanks for that, that very particular question. So as you can tell, um, Alan knows my work as well as Lubena's work. Um, and, he, and he has published quite a bit about Lubena's work. Um, yes, I, you know, as the show was being set up, I was in contact with Lubena and with the people at the Tate about the positions of things. And um, absolutely, it is choreographed. The show, we spectators are choreographed in terms of the sequence of things. Sometimes it was a bit frustrating, I think for, I don't wanna put words in her mouth, but um, you know, as with um, fashionable marriage, this question, you know, I told her I wanted to talk a lot about backstage and our backstage positions. And then the Tate said, well, there is no backstage. You know, you can, you can be, see it from the side. And I said, well, that's in the wings for the actor. But the, the show was very intentionally structured. Um, and some of that, I suppose, is also COVID, you know, that you couldn't go back again. You had to go forward in a particular pattern. Um, and so Alan's good question about the choreography of the exhibit, I think is really important. Um, that opening was a very busy time, right? So that as we were um, choreographed and moving through, we had one set of experiences and, you know, this is always, I think, both in terms of promenade, but also spectatorship, spectators see each other and are aware of each other's presence and that becomes part of the performance. Um, so when something is as structured as this had to be, um, the, we move through it in, in um, very much a set way. The show is moving after um, it closes in July and the Tate, and then it's moving to Lausanne. And I was speaking to the curator there. Um, and in that case, this show will be on two levels. And so um, I'm very interested in what happens when the movement changes, when what comes up against what is, is different. Um, you know, the, from the academic point of view, the intertextuality, the what, which pieces are up against which pieces, that frames the spectator's experience and the connections we make or don't make um, in a completely different space it will have a very different set of meanings and set of questions. So um, I don't know if this answers you, Alan, but I've been thinking about this quite a bit from the very beginning when we were 
thinking, well, first will COVID let us open? And then what will this mean in terms of moving through and not being able to go back? I've been back again a couple of times. I'm still in London and I'll be there tomorrow talking through the exhibit with some friends. Um, and each time, just like each time you go to see a live performance of any sort, it's different. It will, it will evoke different things. But in this case, our structured choreography will be the same. It's been put together by Lubaina and, you know, under the auspices of what some of the, the needs and restrictions are for the tape. I want to say also that Lubaina's vision, because her vision is not only about specific pieces, but about a large thing, she really has a sense of where the rooms are, where the walls are. What are the shape of the walls? All of that shapes the experience of spectators. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I wish all of you who, unlike me and Alan, have <laughs> not seen it live, but have to see it virtually, could have just a sense of moving through it. And I'm looking forward to seeing what that's like the next and third and fourth times around. And then when it moves to Lausanne. And some of the pieces will be in not only in different places, but may not even be there. So what do those absences mean? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, we have another uh, question in the chat. Okay. Where do you see the white viewer's perspective fitting into this? Since this is art so firmly rooted in the Black experience, do you think it is appropriate to have non-Black voices presenting this information or centering this conversation? Okay, well, that's an important question and I appreciate it. Um, I am not speaking for anyone but my own experience um, based on the conversations that I've had over years um, with Lubaina, but certainly Black spectators, visibly Black spectators, bring to this experience a very different um, point of view. And I think, you know, Lubena has talked about what it was like not to see representations of people who looked like her um, in art at the time, um, as, as she was first studying. And <clears throat> one of the things that I found remarkable was um, being in the room with so many people seeing the beauty of this work and it, and it was a very wonderfully um, diverse group of people at the opening certainly who were drawn to this. So I think I'm, if I'm getting the spirit of this good question well, I, I think it's really important that um, white spectators or academics or anyone else not assume the role of speaking for, <laughs> you know, um, taking on the, the role of, of um, somehow speaking for a, a person of color and their vision, but being very rooted in what one's own experience is. And I think, you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if this is answering the question entirely, but um, there will be and have to be lots of fabulous voices. Those of us who were invited by Lubaina to um, participate in the catalog were, um, I think, selected by her because of our ongoing relationship with Lubaina and her work. So this wasn't a kind of outside academic um, set of voices. Um, so I, I hope that speaks to some of the question, um, but also my, my absolute understanding that it is really key that with all works, that people who are seen to be in, in um, perhaps a more privileged position don't take, don't take that on. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm in a, a friend's house and their doorbell has just rung, so I'm not sure what what that sound is. Um, but I hope that that answers the spirit of the question. Um, and and just one last thing I think about this is that I think you know this construction, our our center that I'm so honored to be part of um, on the advisory board at Hofstra Center of Race, Culture, and Social Justice 
is really committed to looking at race in quotations and the constructiveness of race very broadly. So um, that means that sometimes you don't see the mixed race identities, whether they might be more visible in Lubaina or not in me, but the presence is there and the honoring um, the experience of black art should be everybody's business. Not speaking for a black artist, but honoring the importance of that work. And, um, and I was feeling very honored to be invited by her to do that. And, um, and I hope that more people share the excitement of this wonderful work. Um, are there any other additional questions? There's nothing, uh, great question, okay. Thank you, Lisa, it's a wonderful presentation. Uh, mostly comments, all right. So I think that's it. So Lisa, again, thank you so much for doing this and sharing your, your experience and your work with Lubaina with us. I know you've been working with Lubaina for many years now and have, have we've talked about her work many, numerous times. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate you bringing this to us, sharing it with, you know, the museum membership and the Hofstra community here, and obviously many others. And, well, uh, it's, it's my privilege to be in such wonderful company, um, certainly at home at Hofstra, <laughs> um, and also here in the UK. And I'm just really thrilled that I was, you know, invited yeah. by Luvena. I'm, I'm glad we were, oh, uh, somebody have their hand up. Oh, she's clapping. Um, Ethelene's clapping, that's all. Oh, um, so thank you all for coming. Thank um, you. We really appreciate you, you joining us and I hope you, in, you enjoyed this glimpse of Lubaina. You can go to the Tate London website and they have more information about the exhibit. Um, I, put, I did put the clip um, for the CNN clip in the, in the, the, excuse me, the link in the chat and Lisa was gonna show the, hold up the, Exhibition Look. catalog. Hold it closer oh, to you, Lisa. Yeah. Hold yeah. it closer to you. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, you have your blurred background, so it's not showing up too clearly. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Work. <laughs> no, we worked it out before, but, but not you got to hold it closer to you. There you go. There you go. You can almost see it now. <laughs> I'm just one yeah. essay in um, multiple different perspectives. Um, and there are all kinds of people writing in this book um, from a variety of different perspectives. So it's, it's wonderful um, and obviously available for people to, to get and to read a, about her work. Um, so that's that's great, and also to hear more of Lubaina speaking herself. Um, right. And thank you for putting the clip up. No, no, my pleasure, my pleasure. Glad our technical, our all our technical, technical things worked out. <laughs> great. Okay. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Bye. Bye from love.